is tame compared to the early 1920s when the movie capital was a boom town and thousands headed west, hoping to make it big in pictures. Our story tonight starts in that era. It's a tale told by Sidney Kirkpatrick in his new book, A Cast of Killers, a tale about a murder that was never solved, about a scandal that changed the movie business for decades. It's a twisted tale, and like all good mysteries, a little hard to follow. But it's a true story, so come with me as I take you back when more than movies were shot in Hollywood. Yo, Mabel! <laughs> The year is 1922. The movie business is a smashing success. The name Hollywood has come to mean light and magic for an entire nation. Movie crews are bustling, ready to churn out thousands of feet of silent film. New movies are cranked out at the rate of two a day. Hollywood's future is as bright as the Pacific horizon. But that's about to change. For the talk of the town on this winter day in February 1922 is all about William Desmond Taylor. He's the hottest director around and he's president of the new Directors Association. But that's not why they're talking about him. William Desmond Taylor has been found dead here in his Los Angeles bungalow, a murder that will remain unsolved for the next 64 years. The director's bungalow was torn down in the mid-60s. People now park and shop on the site where Taylor's body was found. His death and the effect it had on the movie community are all but forgotten. The people involved, long gone and buried. Well, all but one. I was quite an investigator. I was a very healthy, and I was not a damn fool either. William Cahill is 100 years old. That long time ago, but I remember it just like yesterday. What did you find when you first arrived at the murder scene? Well, I found several people that didn't belong there. The, the reporters were kind of piling in there, so I fired everybody out, and I kept everything clear. Hollywood scandals were rapidly becoming a public passion in those days. There was fierce competition for the story. The morning after the murder, the photographers had all arrived too late and had missed the body, so one editor just penciled it in. This is how the newspapers described the murder for their readers. Inside, the scene was bizarre. While Taylor's body was lying face up in the study, his butler was calmly washing dishes. A Paramount executive was burning papers in a fireplace. And there were reports that a silent screen star was rifling through his desk drawers. All of a sudden, a mysterious man who claimed to be a doctor came in, examined the body, and declared that Taylor had died of a stomach hemorrhage. The butler quickly said, oh yes, I just bought him a bottle of milk of magnesia yesterday. And the Paramount executive and the silent screen star reportedly chimed in, oh, Taylor always suffered from stomach trouble. All of a sudden, the doctor disappeared. Police knelt down, rolled over the body, and found a pool of blood and a neat little bullet hole right in his back. It was obvious they had a whodunit on their hands. And who had done it? Inquiring minds wanted to know. There was considerable speculation by the press. Much was being made of certain scandalous items that had been found in Taylor's bungalow. Now, I searched the rooms and I found Mary Miles Miller's lingerie in, in the little drawer in the, in, the, in the bedroom upstairs. Mary Miles Minter? Sweet virginal teenage star of the silent screen? What a juicy discovery! The papers reported that her nightgown and other items with the initials MMM had been found in the director's bedroom, along with love letters and pornographic pictures of his affairs with other stars. Was it a lover's quarrel? Mary Miles Minter quickly became a prime suspect, and so did her fiercely protective mother, Charlotte Shelby, who owned a 38 special just like the one that killed William Desmond Taylor. Or was it his chauffeur, Edward Sands, who had robbed Taylor the year before and was suspected of blackmailing Taylor with information about his sexual escapades with starlets? Or was it the silent screen star reportedly at Taylor's bungalow that morning rifling through Taylor's desk drawers? That was Mabel Norman. Her screen career would soon be on the rocks because of the Taylor murder and the revelation that she was, in fact, a cocaine addict. She was the last person to see Taylor alive before he was murdered. Identifying suspects was much easier than identifying the killer. 
Eventually, more than 300 suspects were questioned and cleared. No one was ever indicted. Over the years, reporters moved on to other murders. The scandal faded. The Taylor murder was forgotten by all but a few. Enter a movie director named King, yes, King Vidor, a new character in our story. He started in pictures about the same time as William Desmond Taylor, but went on to direct such epics as Duel in the Sun and Henry Fonda and Audrey Hepburn in War and Peace. In 1967, Vidor decided to make a movie about the unsolved Taylor murder. In researching the case, he turned detective and actually solved the murder. But the answers shocked Vidor. With so many participants still alive, he abandoned the project, buried the evidence, and took the secret to his grave. Enter Sidney Kirkpatrick, author and documentary filmmaker, who three years ago started out writing a biography of King Vidor. But he ended up writing something entirely different. What he discovered was that King Vidor saved everything. Laundry receipts, theater stubs, Valentine cards, everything. Except one thing was missing. The year 1967. Sidney, how did you find it? Oh, well, Connie, it was incredible. Uh, we launched a three-month hunt through King Vidor's homes, crawling in attics, pulling up floorboards, and eventually, under the hot water heater in his Beverly Hills guest house, I found a locked steel trunk. And you pried it open, and what did you find? Well, inside, I found out who killed William Desmond Taylor. Am I blue? Am Kirkpatrick was amazed at how thorough Vidor's investigation had been. What the director claimed to have found was a story often completely at odds with that in the newspapers. At the time of the murder, reporters had persisted in tying the chauffeur, Edward Sands, and the silent screen star, Mabel Norman, to the murder. But Fedor's investigation found that the police had never seriously considered either one as suspects. Police had been suspicious of a certain mother and daughter. Vidor found strong evidence pointing the finger at Mary Miles Minter and her mother, Charlotte. Mary loved Taylor desperately. She had pursued him to the point of embarrassment. Mary would, would approach Taylor and beg for his love. Uh, there, there, there was one, you know, one particularly sad scene uh, in the police records where uh, Mary disrobed and actually begged for Taylor's love and, and could not understand why Taylor wasn't giving it to her. But Vidor found out why he seemed so reluctant to make love to the young actress. For years, Vidor had heard rumors about Taylor's secret sex life. Rumors that were confirmed during a visit with a man who had been a close friend of Taylor's. When, when King had gone to visit George Hopkins, you know, he'd gone with one thing, with one specific question in mind, you know, was William Desmond Taylor homosexual or not? And if so, how do you know? Well, um... George knew, and George knew from first-hand experience. Did you know that now, years later, there's strong belief that William Desmond Taylor was homosexual? Is that a fact? I never knew that. I never knew that. I never heard that before. Why is it I never heard that in all these years? Why hadn't Cahill and the rest of the country heard about this revelation before? Vidor discovered a shocker. The people from Paramount at Taylor's bungalow the morning the body was found hadn't been removing evidence, they had been planting evidence. Love letters and the lingerie Detective Cahill had discovered. All they were trying to do was to cover up the details of, of Taylor's dark side, his homosexuality. Uh, and the easiest way to do that was to plant lingerie, was to plant photographs. And, you know, the, the, the sad part about it was that, um, you know, someone had to pay the price. Planting scandalous evidence had been a clever idea. Vidor realized that Paramount executives in one move had managed to preserve the macho image of their star director and at the same time they had also managed to ruin the career of Mary Miles' mentor, someone they wanted to unload anyway. The studio had decided Mary was making too much money for too little return at the box office. Although she was young and quite beautiful, she suffered one major drawback. She couldn't act for beans. You get a pain and ruin your tum -tum. In 1919, she had signed a contract with Paramount, $1.3 million, a record at the time. A clause in the contract funneled all her wages to Charlotte. Studio executives have found the mother to be a real pain. She'd often been heard threatening to kill anyone who got close to Mary Miles' mentor. 
Even Taylor had been threatened by Charlotte. Detective Cahill happened to visit with the director before he was murdered. One day when I went in, they said, I don't know what I'm going to do with that woman. It says, I'm having great trouble with her. With Mary Miles Miller's mother. Charlotte coveted Mary's millions so that she could afford the lifestyle to which she had become accustomed. She enjoyed living in this opulent mansion, still standing here in Los Angeles. And it was here, on a hot summer night, about a year and a half before the murder, that a significant and memorable event occurred. An event that shows us just how loving mother and daughter really were. Charlotte would become abusive towards Mary if she showed the slightest interest in men. Charlotte had a violent argument with Mary, accusing her of sleeping with William Desmond Taylor. Mary grabbed her mother's pistol and ran up the stairs screaming. Once she locked herself in her mother's bedroom, she discovered the gun had a safety latch on it. She had no idea how to work it. She fiddled with it. Suddenly, three times in the ceiling, the floor, and in the door jam. Her suicide attempt had failed. From then on, the relationship between Mary and her mother became increasingly strained. As Mary Miles Minter's career was going down the tubes, Taylor's directing career was rocketing, one box office success after another. Mary, apparently unaware of Taylor's secret sex life, clung to the hope that he would marry her, thus rescuing her from the iron claw of Mother Charlotte. As for Taylor, he was friendly towards Mary. He treated her like a daughter. Nevertheless, the relationship enraged Charlotte. I figured her. I figured, I figured her. She was jealous of Barry, and I tell you, she was in love with him. Charlotte Shelby was in love with yes, William yes, Desmond she Taylor? Was. Yes, she But wasn't her daughter, Mary Miles Minter, also in love with William oh, Desmond Taylor? definitely. Definitely. Detective Cahill was one of many King Vidor interviewed in 1967. When Vidor assembled his notes and reviewed the material, he began to piece together a new version of what happened on that February evening, 1922. On the night of the murder, Charlotte overheard Mary talking to Taylor on the phone, saying she wanted to run away. Outraged, Charlotte locked Mary in her room. But Mary managed to escape from the mansion. What King discovered was that Mary had actually visited Taylor that night. And, um, at Charlotte Shelby had discovered them there. And just as, as Charlotte had warned Taylor, you know, before she shot him. Charlotte shot Taylor in the back in cold blood, killing him instantly. That's how King Vidor's notes describe the murder. But investigator Bill Cahill thinks Taylor's last gasp may also have been his last grasp. Charlotte Shelby must have had her arm around William Desmond Taylor. Yeah, I'd say it's because it went in, you know, you take when the coat is off, and when he raises the coat up, the bullet hole is way down here, you see? Whoever got killed him had his arms, or arms around him. So if Cahill is right, the newspaper touch-up artist was wrong. Charlotte Shelby shot Taylor while giving him a goodbye kiss. Some mother she was. Through the years, Hollywood gossip had often suggested what Vidor seems to have proved. Mary Miles Minter's mother killed the director in a burst of jealous rage. So why didn't the detectives working on the case reach the same conclusion? One DA after another pulled the detectives off the case. Um, you know, the, the murder could have been solved in 1922 if the police had been allowed to do their job. The truth was, they weren't. Why weren't they? Charlotte Shelby was using her daughter's millions to keep her out of pr prison. She was using her daughter's money to pay one district attorney off after another. Do you think it's conceivable that the district attorney was on the take? I think the district attorney knew all about it. I think he knew whatever transpired, I think he knew all about it. He knew that Charlotte I Shelby... I think they closed it right up. Because she was turned loose not very long after that. Something had to happen. The shot fired that night ruined several lives. According to the book, the chauffeur, Edward Sands, committed suicide six weeks after the slaying. The shot ended the career of Mabel Norman, queen of comedy. She died in 1930. Apparently, her death was due to drugs. Charlotte died in 1957. There was a funeral. 
But in a final bizarre twist to this strange tale, Charlotte may not have died in 1957. She may have lived on, a captive of her daughter, all in an effort to avoid death row. At the time Charlotte was supposed to have died, she and daughter Mary had been living here in Santa Monica. George Noonan was a close friend of the family. I came across a letter that was written in 1960 to uh, Mary's mother, and it had to do with uh, a doctor taking care of her. And the doctor said that, uh, you know, uh, why didn't she just quit the charade, so to speak, and just, you know, let everyone know that she was alive and that, that she was being attended to by a doctor and whatever. And author Sidney Kirkpatrick talked to several people who reported seeing Charlotte alive after she was supposedly dead. Charlotte Shelby was living in a small upstairs room, uh, sitting in a rocking chair day and night watching television and chain smoking uh, Lucky Strike cigarettes. Um, if you go in the room right now, um, it still, still reeks and still smells of Lucky Strike cigarettes. I'll tell you that. The Minter house is empty now. Mary died two years ago alone. In the end, the petite star had become horribly obese. But those who knew Mary say her life really ended the day William Desmond Taylor was killed, the day she lost any hope of ever escaping from Charlotte's web. On his final visit with Mary, as King Vidor got up to leave, Mary, close to tears, blurted out these words, My mother killed everything I ever loved.